Good afternoon and um, welcome to Psychiatry Grand Rounds. Uh, my name is Tony Rothschild. I'm the chair of the Grand Rounds Committee. A couple of announcements and reminders. Um, although you've signed into Grand Rounds on Zoom in order to receive credit for attending, please fill out the uh, survey monkey um, that was sent uh, along with the Grand Rounds announcement on Monday uh, by Karen Lambert. Um, the leadership group of the department has decided to continue uh, having grand rounds on Zoom for the rest of calendar year 2021 and for January and February of 2022. We are tentatively planning to have the speakers come in person in March of 2022, but of course, we will always be available on Zoom uh, for the audience as it was prior to the uh, pandemic. Um, if you have questions for today's speakers, please type them in the chat function, and um, uh, Dr. Padija will be asking the speakers the questions at the end of the talk. Um, next week's Grand Rounds will be given by Dr. Christoph Corell, and the title of his talk is Beyond Dopamine, Novel and Emerging Treatments for uh, Schizophrenia. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lala Padija, uh, who you all know, but in case you don't, she is the Psychiatry Residency uh, Program Director and also the Director of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. Dr. Padija. Thank you, Dr. Rothschild. And it is my pleasure to introduce you to our two speakers today. Uh, first, we have Dr. Janet Lewis, who is a psychiatrist in private practice, a clinical assistant professor at the University of Rochester, a founding member of the Climate Psychiatry Alliance, and the co-chair of the Group for the Adva Advancement of Psychiatry's Climate Committee. She has a particular expertise in climate-related distress and has given numerous like, academic presentations on climate mental health, including an annual meetings of the American Psychiatric Association, and is an author on climate papers in professional journals such as Psychodynamic Psychiatry, Journal of Nervous and Mental Disease, and JAMA Network Open. She also teaches a three-part seminar for PGY 1s and 2s, Psychiatry Residence on Climate Change and Psychiatry. And in collaboration with the Climate Psycho Psychology Alliance, she is working on a comprehensive review of mental health aspects of climate change. And with us today, we also have Dr. Josh Wurzel, and he is a chief resident in psychiatry at the University of Rochester. He completed his bachelor's in art in human development Developmental and Regenerative Biology at Harvard, Harvard College, his master's in philosophy in clinical research at Cambridge University, and his medical education at Stanford University. Now during residency, he's also pursuing a master's health professions education at the University of, of Rochester. Much of his current research involves studying the impacts of climate on mental health. He is a member of the APA Committee on Climate and Mental Health, a steering committee member of the nonprofit Climate Psychiatry Alliance, and a participant of the group of, for, for the Advancement of Psychiatry Climate Committee. Uh, Dr. Warshaw also serves as the chair of the APA, uh, APA Foundation Leadership Fellow and is a trainee editorial fellow for the Journal of Academic Psychiatry. Dr. Warshaw has presented, taught, and published in the topic of climate change. And some of his projects include investigating the impact of climate change on pediatric mental health and an analysis of the estimated carbon footprint of the average APA annual meeting, which I thought was very interesting and relevant. Uh, so welcome both of you and I'll let you jump right in. Okay, thank you. So let me get my presentation up here. I'll be speaking and then Dr. Wurtz will be speaking and then I'll be speaking again. Um, So uh, it's good to be here. Of course, we're talking about climate change and psychiatry. I have no actual or potential conflicts of interest related to this presentation. Here are the objectives for my portion of the presentation. It's conventional in academic presentations to discuss things in our best objective terms, sometimes with dissociation of affect, as though something is easy to think about when actually many things, including climate change, are very challenging to think about. Acknowledging this is one of the only ways to make sense of the fact that climate mental health is a relatively young field. Very young, very recent. Uh, here's a brief history 
of American psychiatry's involvement with climate change. While there have always been environmentally active psychiatrists, it wasn't until 2016 that the Climate Psychiatry Alliance uh, and the Group for the Advancement of Psychiatry um, uh, Climate Committee uh, were founded. Uh, there have been related action papers accepted um, uh, by the APA uh, since that time. Um, and in 2020, the APA established a climate committee within their structure, which uh, Dr. Wurzel is on. So psychiatry's engagement with climate change is recent. And not only does climate change have profound effects on mental health, but perhaps most importantly, our ability as human beings to think clearly and take appropriate actions in the midst of this multifaceted crisis, that very capacity is something that we have expertise in. Uh, so it's okay we're late to the party, and most professions are, but thank goodness we are here. Within psychiatry, we have crucial contributions to make in addressing climate change on multiple fronts. In 2018, Coverdale et al. published an important piece in academic psychiatry about addressing climate change in all aspects of psychiatry, using this CARE, an acronym standing for Clinical, Administrative, Research, and Education. Many of us have since added advocacy, allowing the A to do double duty. Very quickly, climate change. Most of you have probably seen some variation of this scary graph based on data from Antarctic ice cores. It depicts CO2 levels in the atmosphere over the past 800,000 years. And as you can see, carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere go up and down and up and down until recent decades when they're going up and up. As a greenhouse gas, CO2, along with methane and some other gases, trap the infrared portion of the solar radiation as it reflects back off the Earth, not only heating the Earth, but destabilizing the climate system. Adding to this very concerning situation are greenhouse gas residence times in the atmosphere. According to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, methane stays in the atmosphere for 12 years. CO2 stays in the atmosphere for varying lengths of time, depending on conditions, but usually for decades. So future warming effects are already baked in to the system. Um, adding even further to our predicament are feedback loops that are accelerating the warming effects, such as the loss of the albedo effect of melting ice and the melting of permafrost, which is known to contain large amounts of methane. Important concepts applicable in all fields of study with regards to climate change are mitigation, adaptation, maladaptation, and the implications of complex systems. Mitigation, as we know, is lessening the damaging effects of something, in this case, for instance, with the cutting of fossil fuel use, uh, the preservation and planting of trees, the preservation and, and promoting of ocean life, which is also a large carbon sink. These are forms of mitigation. Adaptation is preparing for the impacts that are already baked in, developing resilience, um, very importantly, some definitions of resilience also include not only making changes, but transforming when necessary. With maladaptation, something may appear superficially adaptive, but actually be maladaptive. If you lose your house in a wildfire or a storm, it may seem that by rebuilding, you're being quite resilient. Uh, but if you rebuild in the same vulnerable way without taking climate change into account, it's maladaptive. And similarly, psychologically, there are maladaptive responses that can appear superficially adaptive. For instance, one may appear to function well just not thinking about climate change, or someone can appear to be functioning well while using regressive defensives uh, in response to climate-related anxiety, for instance, by externalizing all responsibility. Complexity itself is also an important concept. The climate is a complex system. Not only are the geosciences complex, but they are now also intertwined with human technology, human systems, human cultures, human psychology. There are homeostatic mechanisms in complex systems, but we all know homeostatic mechanisms can get overwhelmed. That's how physicians have jobs. Uh, complexity, perhaps somewhat surprisingly, creates some hopeful aspects of our situation. In a complex system, because things often operate non-linearly, sometimes, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of input makes no difference, but sometimes a small input makes a huge difference. This gets called the butterfly effect, based on the fact that a butterfly flapping its wings in Africa can make the difference as to whether a hurricane hits South Carolina. Another characteristic of complex systems is that 
that's hopeful is the phenomenon called self-organization or emergence, where the whole system can get to a new level of organization, the details of which cannot be completely predicted ahead of time, but it's a new level of organization that works. In biologic systems, it's called evolution, um, but it also happens in social and other kinds of complex systems. Working with wicked problems and complex systems is known to require interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary work and continual reassessment of interventions. And we're dealing with a wicked problem in a complex system. Uh, just last month, the New England Journal of Medicine and over 200 other biomedical journals simultaneously published an editorial underscoring that climate change is our biggest threat to public health and that it requires immediate actions. Urgent society-wide changes must be made fundamental changes to how our societies and economies are organized and how we live. And this, these opinions are based on analyses such as this that was published in Science in 2019, a distillation of major findings from an intergovernmental assessment conducted by an in independent interdisciplinary team of biological and social scientists from over 50 countries. And the assessment analyzed historical trends and possible trajectories involving direct and indirect drivers of the natural world's ability to contribute to humans. And it concluded that in order for the natural world to continue supporting humans, transformation within multiple interdependent systems is necessary. Systems, technology, culture, and accessing uh, pro-social values. Now, <clears throat> I'm not saying that everyone is in a place where they can hear this, I am saying that it's important for us to be grounded in reality so we can help our patients cope and hopefully thrive within this huge transition and so that we can help fashion crucial public health interventions. We'll now review particular climate mental health effects, a topic we won't be discussing much because of time constraint, but it bears mentioning is air pollution, um, air pollution is caused by the burning of fossil fuels, uh, just like most of climate change, and is associated with significant neuropsychiatric effects, particularly including cognitive impairment and association with both, both Alzheimer's and multi-infarct dementia. On a positive note in this regard, decreasing toxic air pollution will be a health co-benefit of cutting uh, fossil fuel use. And now Dr. Wurzel will be talking about heat and nutrition effects. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Lewis. Um, so it is a pleasure to be here. Uh, again, my name is Josh Wurzel. I'm a resident in psychiatry at the University of Rochester. And I'm passionate about trying to understand this role of climate change on mental health. Um, I've been honored to uh, get to work with a couple of different groups about this. And specifically today, I'll be talking about the mental health of society in a warming world. And I'll be reviewing the epidemiology, neuroscience, and indirect psychiatric sequelae that are thought to be affected by ambient heat. I have no disclosures or any conflicts of interest to disclose. So, ladies and gentlemen, you know, kind of building off of what uh, Dr. Lewis has already mentioned, you know, the, the facts are that it's getting hot out there. Um, there have been record high temperatures uh, repeatedly year after year. In 2016, uh, we set the record for the highest temperature uh, globally. And then in 2017, despite El Nino's cooling effects, temperatures nearly reached the 2016 level. NASA recently has reported that um, 2020 actually tied 2016 for the title of the hottest year on record. Um, and since the start of the 21st century, we've had global temperature records that have been broken five times. So given the likelihood that, unfortunately, global temperatures are just likely going to keep getting worse or warmer, it's our duty as mental health providers to think about and to be knowledgeable about how rising temperatures are likely going to impact our patients' health. So I have four learning objectives for us today. Uh, and I hope that um, you'll walk away with being able to answer some of them. First, under direct effects, I'd like you to be able to first be able to describe the relationship of ambient temperature with the prevalence of mental health disorders, and two, describe how psychiatric patients are more prone to thermodysregulation. Under neuroscience, I'd like you to be able to describe the role of serotonin and other neurotransmitters in thermoregulation, and finally, 
um, I'd like you to be able to think about indirect effects. Specifically, we'll be describing the neuropsychiatric sequelae of nutritional deficiencies thought to be uh, secondary to climate change. So we'll start with our first learning objective, looking at the relationship of ambient temperatures and the prevalence of mental health disorders. So here we're looking at mental health conditions in the context of heat waves. And um, heat waves, just as a general definition, are periods of unusually hot weather, that is temperatures that are outside of the historical averages for an area during that time of year. And they typically last around two days or more. Heat waves are clearly not good for mental health. Uh, and you know, we could have a whole talk just on that, but in short, there's an extensive literature that's looked at how violent behaviors increase during heat waves. And this is just one representative study. So Carlton and colleagues had found that when temperatures were abruptly increased during a heat wave, there were corresponding linear increases in rates of violent crime and rape. These two graphs are just from the US data that the Carlton paper looked at, but they found similar trends in countries globally. And this trend is also true for violent suicides. This association between increased temperature and worse mental health seems to also extend to seasonal variation as well. So violent suicides increase in men and women during the spring and summer months. And this is from a study looking at the average monthly suicide rates in Italy averaged over a 10 year period. But other mental health conditions also seem to fare worse as well. So um, in this study, um, this was an Egyptian hospital looking at admission rates for mania. And we see that there's a clear increase in admissions during the spring and summer months. The same is also true for admissions for PTSD in this veterans hospital in New Jersey. But not all mental health conditions necessarily get worse during warmer months. So in fact, in that same Egyptian hospital study looking at mania, they also looked at admissions for unipolar non-seasonal depression. And they found that actually there was a significant decrease during the spring and summer. A similar trend was also observed for a two-year period uh, looking at patients with bulimia in a Vancouver study, where they identified that patients during the spring and summer months actually were least likely at those times to report significant binging and purging uh, behaviors. So then, you know, just to summarize, regarding this first learning objective, the effects of heat on mental health can be quite varied. We see that heat waves and seasonal fluctuations in temperature can be very deleterious for certain psychiatric conditions, but it also seems that some conditions, such as perhaps unipolar depression, may be benefited by seasonal heat. So how do we explain all of this difference in, in variation? So to answer that, or to at least attempt to, let's move to our second learning objective, looking at how we can describe the epidemiology of how psychiatric patients are more prone to, to thermodysregulation. So we've known for quite some time that patients have trouble with thermoregulating and actually specifically depressed patients. Um, this goes all the way back to Vigoro in 1890, when he found that depressed patients had lower skin conductance, which is a measure of a person's ability to sweat. Um, this has been observed in patients uh, with bipolar disorder as well, depressed patients with panic disorder, uh, and also patients with, uh, who, had, who had actually just been prior to attempting suicide. It's also been found that depressed patients on average have increased body temperatures uh, compared to their uh, non-depressed uh, subjects. And we've also known actually for some time that schizophrenic patients have difficulties with temperature regulation. In fact, hot and cold hydrotherapy were two of the original treatments implemented for patients with schizophrenia in the era before neuroleptics because uh, there had been observations that they had difficulties with thermoregulating. And um, it's interesting, but studies before the widespread use of antipsychotics found that schizophrenic patients had lower baseline temperatures uh, than healthy controls. They were found to have dysynchrony of their circadian peaks in temperature and they also had impaired abilities to cool during periods of heat stress. This is likely due uh, because thermodysregulation uh, can be affected by peripheral and central neuropathways uh, that may be due to um, dopaminergic pathway uh, signaling. There's also a growing literature that shows that uh, psychiatric patients are at greater risk for heat-related mortality. Um, in fact, uh, it's been found that 
our patients have three times the risk of suffering heat wave related mortality compared to non-psychiatric patient controls. And multiple factors can increase this risk further, including patients that are bedridden uh, and minimally mobile, if they have a decreased ability to care for themselves, and if they are socially isolated, and finally, if they have any medical comorbidities such as cardiovascular and pulmonary disease, which many of our patients do have. We know that um, some of our psychotropic medications, such as um, serotonergic drugs, can also alter thermoregulation. Uh, it's actually quite a common side effect for antidepressants. 10% of patients on SSRIs will report that they have um, increased diaphoresis and 14% on TCAs. This chart on the right just shows the estimated incidence of diaphoresis for many commonly prescribed antidepressants. And you can see that there's quite a range. We're also aware that these drugs in excess can be implicated in the pathogenesis of serotonin syndrome. And the hyperthermia associated with serotonin syndrome has a complicated pathophysiology, and it likely has to do with which serotonin receptor types are stimulated in the hypothalamus, as well as other peripheral effects of serotonin. Um, and I, I also think it's interesting to add that there have been studies that have shown that body temperatures normalize in depressed patients when they've been on antidepressant treatment, which corresponds to um, some of their symptom remission. And aside from uh, the serotonergic agents, other psychotropics also alter thermoregulation. So antipsychotics, antihistamines, and anticholinergics have all been shown to decrease heat elimination through modulating parasympathetic signaling. Patients on these agents have been found to have increased odds of actually being hospitalized for um, heat-related complications. In one study conducted in France, uh, patients hospitalized with heat stroke or hyperthermia were assessed for the medications that they were on at the time of that admission. And the study identified that relative to age match controls, patients on antipsychotics had six times the odds of being hospitalized for heat stroke or hyperthermia. And this may be due to um, dopamine antagonism altering central acting temperature homeostasis. They also identified that patients on anticholinergics had 4.6 times the odds of being hospitalized for heat stroke or hyperthermia relative to age match controls. And the thought is that this may be due to how anticholinergics decrease sweat production. So in summary, with respect to the second learning objective, depressed and schizophrenic patients have difficulties with thermoregulation and probably other patient populations as well. And this likely has to do why, uh, with why certain uh, patient populations are more prone to heat-related mortality during heat waves. While this thermoregulation seems to improve with serotonergic antidepressants, other agents such as antipsychotics and anticholinergics may further heighten patients' risks of heat-related mortality. So now let's move on to our third learning objective, which is to describe some of the neuroscience of how these neurotransmitters may be implicated in mental illness, uh, as well as in maintaining healthy thermoregulation. So serotonin is instrumental, actually, it turns out, in the process of thermoregulation. And I'll give you a little rundown of how it works. So the body relays information about outside temperatures through thermosensitive proteins in the skin. Uh, and this is conducted through lamina one in the dorsal horn and up through the spinal cord in the spinal brachial pathway. In the brainstem, uh, this stimulates the lateral spinal brachial nucleus which among other things synapses onto the dorsal raphinuclei, which are the main source of serotonin in the brain. The dorsal raphinuclei then sends serotonin to the body's main thermostat, the hypothalamus, and there it can do several things. The hypothalamus contains multiple regions that are responsible for controlling thermoregulatory behaviors and automatic functions. For example, the preoptic area um, can control heat dissipation through panting and vasodilation, and then the posterior area controls heat conservation and heating through vasoconstriction and shivering. Depending upon the part of the hypothalamus that's stimulated by the dorsal raphinuclei, as you can imagine, you get different thermoregulatory processes that are set in motion. Now, relevant to the role of serotonin in the context of this presentation, there have actually also been some very elegant studies in animals to flesh out this role of ambient temperature on um, the serotonin pathways. So for example, in this study, 
um, there were two groups of rats that were exposed to different ambient temperatures. One uh, had been placed in an environment that was 23, 23 degrees Celsius, which are shown in blue, and another that uh, were exposed to 37 degrees Celsius, shown in red. And after close to two hours at those temperatures, the researchers recorded the rat's core body temperatures rectally, and this is recorded on the x-axis, and they harvested the rat's brains to find their dorsal raphe nuclei. There they identified the serotonergic neurons, and they looked at the transcriptional activity of those neurons using the marker CFOS. They counted the number of CFOS positive neurons, and that's shown here on the y-axis, and then they compared the two groups. And as you can see, increased ambient temperature and core body temperature were strongly linearly correlated with the activity of the serotonergic neurons in the dorsal raphe nuclei. Other neurotransmitters, though, also have critically important roles in thermoregulation. It's not just serotonin. Um, norepinephrine and epinephrine control peripheral vasoconstriction through alpha signaling, and norepinephrine stimulates brown fat to promote thermogenesis. Acetylcholine binds to muscarinic receptors to peripherally control the release of sweat. GABA inhibition, uh, peripheral vasoconstriction leads to tonic vasodilation and cooling. And glutamate in the primary, uh, is the primary neurotransmitter, I should say, that um, communicates excitatory information about ambient heat through the spinothalamic pathway. So that's a lot. But in summary, with respect to this third learning objective, we see that serotonin plays a crucial role in maintaining thermal regulation. It does this by stimulating the temperature homeostatic centers of the hypothalamus. And we see that um, there is direct correlation between ambient temperature and serotonin production in the dorsal raphe nuclei. We also uh, reviewed a couple other neurotransmitters that play critical roles in temperature modulation, both peripherally and centrally. And finally, um, let's cover the last learning objective, which is to briefly discuss the indirect effects of increased ambient heat and changing climate on mental health. We'll touch base also on um, the neuropsychiatric sequelae of several nutritional deficiencies secondary to climate change as just uh, a small look at some of these indirect effects. A lot of energy has been put in uh, by the agricultural sector to look at what predicted impacts of climate change will be on human food security. Uh, and there's no question that increased droughts and decreased arable land carry their own risks of mental health complications. However, here we're gonna look at um, an interesting subset of that literature of how climate change may be changing nutritional content of the food as well. It turns out that um, when uh, they've experimented in growing crops in experimental conditions to replicate atmospheres with increased CO2, they found that increased CO2 decreases concentrations of key macronutrients and micronutrients in some of our important food crops. In, in particular, they found that these plants seem to produce less protein and absorb less zinc and less iron. This is just one representative study. Um, they grew a variety of crops uh, in atmospheric conditions predicted to occur by 2050 if we don't change the way that we are producing CO2 right now. And you can see here um, the percent reductions in the protein content, which are shown in red, iron content shown in blue, and zinc content shown in gray relative to plants as they're currently grown uh, in our current atmosphere, uh, which is the dotted line here. And overall, these experiments are showing that uh, there may be a 4 to 13% reduction in these nutrients uh, that our plants may be producing as of 2050, again, if, if our production of CO2 doesn't change. And this is important complications for mental health. We know that iron deficiency uh, actually plays quite a significant role in um, psychiatry and, and has psychiatric sequelae. Iron deficiencies have been associated with altered monoamine neurotransmitter levels and even the abnormal myelination of white matter tracts in children. It's also been associated with childhood and adolescent onset of psychiatric disorders and cognitive developmental delay. Um, in one large retrospective case control study um, of children with iron deficiency in Taiwan, the authors identified that in those who had iron deficiency, there was an increased odds ratio of developing a number of different psychiatric conditions. 
So for unipolar depression, the odds ratio was 2.3. For bipolar disorder, it was 5.8. For autism spectrum disorder, it was 3.1. And for developmental delay, uh, 2.5. We also know that zinc deficiency is associated with psychiatric sequelae. Specifically, uh, it's been found that zinc is involved with a lot of the regulation of endocrine, immune, and neuronal functions that are implicated in the pathophysiology of depression. Uh, in animal models where um, they have uh, deprived animals of zinc, they found that um, peripheral blood samples uh, of zinc levels were associated with increased depressed behaviors. So let me explain that a little better. Basically, um, when animals had uh, clinical zinc deficiency, they also had co-occurring depressed behaviors. And these were reversed when adequate zinc uh, was um, provided and blood levels returned to normal. In a meta-analysis of 17 studies that were measuring peripheral blood uh, zinc levels in patients, um, they found that depressed patients versus controls had um, significantly lower levels of zinc, uh, specifically around two micromoles uh, per liter of zinc. And just to give you a reference, that's actually um, pretty significant because the normal range for zinc in the blood is around 14 to 23 uh, micromoles. So that small difference actually may, may make um, quite a difference when it comes to depressed symptoms. They also found that there was a linear inverse relationship between zinc levels in the blood and depression severity. So in other words, the lower the zinc was in a patient, the more severe they rated their depression symptoms. So to summarize then that final learning objective, beyond just the direct impacts of heat and climate on mental health, there are also indirect effects um, that are gonna be important to consider. We briefly reviewed here just how plant nutritional context can be altered by changes in CO2 levels um, and iron deficiency and zinc deficiencies in particular may contribute to uh, increased prevalence and severity of many psychiatric and neurodevelopmental disorders. But you, know, you could imagine that uh, disease vectors will also change, which many have uh, neuropsychiatric sequelae but we won't have time to talk about that here. So we've covered a whole heck of a lot of ground uh, pretty quickly. So I just wanna recap a couple key takeaways. Um, first, many psychiatric disorders are affected by ambient heat. Many are made worse, but some, including perhaps unipolar depression, appear to improve. Second, many psychiatric patients have difficulties with thermoregulation, and this places them at increased risk of heat-related illnesses, like heat stroke and hyperthermia. Some psychotropic medications like SSRIs may improve heat regulation, while others like antipsychotics and anticholinergics may in fact exacerbate it. We reviewed uh, some of the neuroscience of how neurotransmitters are implicated in mental illness, or sorry, uh, how neurotransmitters that are implicated in mental illness can also be involved with thermoregulation. Uh, and this may explain why some of our patients have difficulties with thermoregulating. And lastly, um, there will be indirect effects of climate change on mental health as well, uh, including nutritional deficiencies that have neuropsychiatric sequelae. So given everything I've said, what does this mean then with respect to global warming? You know, so for one, it seems like there's no question that um, there will be increased temperatures uh, that are going to affect the prevalence of many psychiatric disorders. And some of that, like violence and suicide is likely to get worse, and some like depression may improve. But, you know, that's certainly going to be complicated by all of the increased stress and traumas, uh, both on familial and societal level, that are frankly unlike anything our species has seen in millennia. And all of that adds to, um, you know, frankly trying to think about the underlying neurochemical impacts of increased heat. Uh, it's quite complicated to know um, the, the fallout, but it doesn't seem good. And obviously the indirect complications of nutritional deficiencies further complicate that picture. Um, I think that, you know, one key takeaway I, I'd like us to walk away, is, away with is, um, you know, as mental health providers, we need to be stewards of our patients because um, they're often not able to advocate for themselves. We need to be able to advocate for our patients to have access to housing with adequate cooling. We need to be mindful of the medications we're prescribing that can exacerbate some of the issues with thermoregulation. 
And we also need to be sure that um, as a society of physicians, we're minimizing our contribution to this problem. Um, unfortunately, I don't have enough time to go into this today, but actually we're doing quite a lot of work with the APA to consider how we can try to dramatically decrease the carbon footprint of American psychiatry. And this can include reimagining the logistics of our annual meeting, um, thinking about our virtual residency match, and even how telepsychiatry can be used to dramatically decrease our footprint. I'd also just like to thank uh, a few of my colleagues and mentors. Um, first, uh, as a member of the Climate Psychiatry Alliance, it's such a pleasure working with a group of psychiatrists who are passionate about this topic and they've taught me so much. And I recommend you, um, you know, looking at our website to find more information if you'd like to learn more. I'd also like to thank uh, my members of the APA Climate Committee, uh, hence all the APA themed uh, background, but it's um, a real honor working with all of them. Oops. I also wanna thank uh, my original mentor, Dr. Norton, who uh, had introduced me to this field and has been such a tremendous resource for me along the way. And then my chair uh, of psychiatry here at Rochester, Dr. Lee, who has been very supportive of my research. And um, these are tiny, but these are the references that I had um, discussed today. And uh, thank you so much for having me. It's really a pleasure to be here. I will hand it back to Dr. Lewis. So I will uh, work at getting back in here. All right. Is uh, is my screen being shared here? No. Okay. Hmm. Now we can see it. I see it. Okay, good. Uh, so now I'll focus on disasters caused by extreme weather. I'm going to say some quite disturbing things. Uh, I guess Dr. Warsell has already prepared everyone for that. Um, you are going to be seeing increased frequency and severity of disasters, more intense storms, more wildfires, sea level rise and other floods, more heat waves and consequent social, economic, and infrastructure uh, disruptions as a result of these events, as well as anticipated forced migrations and uh, threats to clean water and food. These effects hit some areas first and worst. In general, dry areas are getting drier and wet areas are getting wetter. So here in the Northeast, more flooding events are anticipated in, in addition to more heat waves. We all know that disasters can produce trauma as well as having associations with depression, anxiety, substance misuse and domestic violence and breakdowns of community infrastructure. Rates of PTSD following disaster vary widely but are often 25 to 30%. The level of disaster exposure influences development of PTSD. So our increasing severity of disasters is concerning. Evacuation is known to decrease risk of PTSD but it's no panacea. In Hurricane Katrina, one study documented that 62% of evacuees met criteria for acute stress disorder. And where we have trauma, we also need to be concerned about the transgenerational transmission of trauma, which occurs via various mechanisms, including uh, attachment with traumatized caregivers. There's particular concern for effects of climate change on young children um, due to a few different factors, developmental vulnerability, for example, uh, disaster before the age of five uh, was shown to be associated with increased risk of anxiety disorders in adulthood, even when family psychiatric history and demographics were controlled for. Uh, children uh, in many studies have been shown to have existential concerns about their future. And the dependency of young people can lead to particular feelings of betrayal by adults and governments in considering climate change. Um, this is documented in a, a study that's now in press um, that had 10,000 um, survey uh, respondents. There are other important climate disparities. Worldwide nations contributing least to greenhouse gas emissions are typically suffering the effects of climate change disproportionately. Within the US, low income and BIPOC communities often suffer first and worst, the climate effects. 
Also, our patients, the mentally ill, are particularly vulnerable, not only to heat, as Dr. Wurzel was describing, but also to disasters. Uh, there's increased risk of psychiatric illness recurrence following disaster, especially for those with PTSD. But it's also the case that the mentally ill may be less prepared for disasters, and systems of care are often uh, disrupted uh, or overwhelmed. For those with serious mental illness, as compared to those with mental, uh, without mental illness, disaster mental health services, such as psychological first aid, are equally beneficial. So safety, calming, social connection, personal and psychological efficacy, and a sense of hope and optimism are all helpful uh, during and in the immediate aftermath of disasters. Care should be taken to avoid isolating or stigmatizing the mentally ill, and since uh, exacerbations of illness are often associated with insomnia, optimizing sleep is crucial following disasters. And lastly, it's thought that distress can be reduced with preparation. So disaster plans for patients, including emergency contact information, a list of their medications, refilling medications before they're empty, identifying emergency shelter, and housing options uh, is thought to be important. We have well, a well-developed field of disaster psychiatry, but most harmful impacts from climate disruption are expected to be from persistent overwhelming toxic stresses, not just acute disasters. An important emerging concept is continuous traumatic stress. It derives from contexts similar to ongoing climate disruption, such as protracted civil conflict or pervasive community violence, with continuous traumatic stress, um, uh, this, this is being reported in those kinds of regions. When you think about it, traditional conceptualizations of trauma, traumatic events uh, involve them existing in the past with maladaptive intrusion into the present. Uh, but what if the trauma is in the present and the future? Continuous traumatic stress describes more continuous trauma that's both, both current and is to be reasonably anticipated in the future. Those dealing with continuous traumatic stress can experience arousal and avoidance, very much like PTSD, but their preoccupation is typically with current and future safety rather than past events. A study of soldiers with so-called pre-traumatic stress also supports the existence of this condition. The task in therapeutic work is to develop the ability to discriminate between stimuli that might pose a real, immediate, and substantial threat from other everyday stimuli and to prepare for future traumatization. Clinicians can only do this work if we ourselves can think reasonably clearly about the current and future threats. So we need population level adaptation for a kind of transformational resilience to build capacity of individuals, families, organizations, and communities to, to both cope with climate adversities and to avoid the kinds of regressions that cause harm. Um, those involved in this field recognize the need for mental health trainings that can be given to large groups, large scale. Um, a promising program uh, developed by Bob Dopelt uh, is called Transformational Resilience and it seeks to do this. It has two primary components termed presencing and purposing. Presencing involves psychoeducation and mindfulness and grounding skills, while purposing involves an accessing and application of values, a process uh, quite similar to acceptance and commitment therapy. Next, I'll mention climate-related distress. Uh, the terms eco-anxiety or climate anxiety may have outlived their usefulness as they cover a whole myriad of indirect reactions to climate change and other ecological degradation. According to data from the Yale surveys, the Yale climate surveys, the majority of Americans are now worried about climate change and 21%, that's one in five Americans, are very worried about climate change. Ecological worry in most people is not maladaptive. It's usually adaptive. It's very important that we not pathologize distress over climate change. However, there are now clinically significant kinds of environmental stress getting described. And of course, it can have complex interrelationship with other psychiatric disorders. Uh, this word cloud figure from a review by Coffey et al. highlights the broad range of vocabulary and phrases in the existing literature to illustrate various concepts related, related to eco-anxiety. The term solastalgia there in the middle refers to a kind of nostalgia you can have while still at home when the environment no longer offers the same solace, and there is a, a research base for it. 
Um, Yale does periodic surveys of Americans' attitudes towards global warming. Now most Americans are alarmed or concerned. And the proportion that are out and out dismissive of the scientific consensus is down to 7%. So that's good news. Climate change is a unique stressor. It's been called a hyper object. A hyper object is something that has coherence and vitality, but it's so distributed through space and time and we're inside it that in a sense, it's impossible to completely wrap one's mind around it. Yet we have responsibilities to participate in influencing it and its effects. There are many sources of anxiety related to climate change, which we should appreciate. There's threats to anything anyone cares about. Uh, there's disorientation in and grief over the changing world, loss of previously imagined legacies, empathy for current and future suffering, worries for children and grandchildren, trauma and demoralization with repeated disasters and displacements. And there's uncertainty about what physical reality is going to look like. And there are also stressors within social reality. There's a cognitive dissonance as we're all embedded in systems involving fossil fuels and animal agriculture, these things that we know are damaging the environment. Um, anime refers to when the society doesn't respect, re reflect one's values. Um, there's a lack of words and terms for current experience, though this is getting better, a lack of appropriate discussion at every level, though this is improving. And there's still inadequate social response, though this is improving. There's also stress involved in social discomfort and conflict in addressing climate change, and also difficulty integrating the information. You know, uh, it, we can all be seen to be in phases of emerging from disavowal. That's the defense mechanism where you both know and don't know something at the same time. And we recursively go through uh, the degrees of disavowal and then coming to terms with things more deeply. And as this goes on, we're able to. Um, ideally come to terms with reality more and more deeply. And there's uncertainty about what social reality is going to look like. The um, uh, mental health professionals, we all have cause to be as disoriented as others in confronting the realities of climate change. But we do have understandings and skills that are pathways out of disorientation. And while we have to use clinical judgment as to how this is done, medical ethicists have weighed in that the benefits of discussing climate change with patients generally outweigh the risks. As I mentioned, there are particular concerns about children's reactions to climate change. A series of studies, qualitative studies followed by a quantitative study were conducted by Ojala with young participants in Sweden. She identified three overall coping strategies. Emotion-focused coping, which involved de-emphasizing the seriousness of climate change um, to avoid negative feelings. Um, this kind of coping was associated with less negative affect, um, but also with less engagement in pro-environmental activities. Uh, the second form is uh, problem-focused coping, which involves looking for solutions and looking for things that one can do. When, when this comes to climate change, this type of coping was positively related to negative affect, um, even though these people were more environmentally engaged. But thirdly, there was meaning-focused coping, uh, which was associated both with less negative affect, more life satisfaction, more positive affect, and more pro-environmental involvement. Now, direction of causality can't be certain. It may be that more optimistic people also use more meaning-focused coping. But meaning-focused coping was thought to generate positive affect that tended to buffer against the negative affect. Um, meaning-focused coping involved people drawing on their beliefs, values, and existential goals to, to sustain well-being. And it's believed to be particularly important when a stressor can't be removed or solved all at once, but still demands active involvement. Um, it includes finding benefit in the situation, revision of goals, leaning on spiritual beliefs, and also participating, involving oneself in positive reappraisals, uh, acknowledging the stressor, but also being able to reverse one's perspective. In the children, these positive reappraisals often involve forms of trust, trust in one's own ability to influence things, trust in other actors like scientists and environmental organizations, and also a historical perspective, knowing that awareness among people is increasing. Um, I'm also going to suggest here some uh, positive reappraisals that adults are often able uh, to get to. 
Uh, the situation being so serious also means what we do now is really important. The situation being so complex also means the butterfly effect is at, as at play. Who knows what the impact of one's own actions might be? It may be huge. That no one can figure things out means we're being thrown into ways of thinking and behaving that are actually more mature. We have to work with others to figure things out and create change. We have to accept uncertainty. Our being forced to grow up in this way is a positive thing. So you'll notice in these reappraisals, two factors are at play. One is the evoking of positive affect, and the other is the use of both and thinking. Promoting both and thinking is essential in working with climate material. And the therapist has to do this as they witness and validate feelings and rational thinking about how serious and heartbreaking our situation is. And at the same time, facilitate, re facilitate reframes that can help to make the awareness bearable and evoke positive affect and facilitate agency, particularly for work with others. This both end thinking is required on many fronts in working with climate material. A paper I wrote with doctors uh, Haas and Trope published in Psychodynamic Psychiatry was about the importance of being able to think about dialectics in working with climate material. A dialectic is any pair of seemingly opposed concepts that are actually both important. And when they're explored and the relationship between them is explored, it can be generative. There's room for creative solutions. Um, we believe that the topic of climate itself naturally creates dialectics. It's impossible to contain the complexity and uncertainty, so the mind naturally engages in a kind of splitting. And that's why managing these dialectics is key to work with climate material. There are numerous dialectics that arise in climate material. We, we believe these are the core ones here, um, but they tend to continuously arise. So it's important to simplistically not side with one pole or other uh, in, in a dialectic, but instead hold the space between them open to allow a grappling with them that can produce useful integrations. Um, for example, in the hope-hopelessness dialectic, Hope is experienced as essential, but seemingly impossible, as many destructive processes are already hopelessly underway. This is true. Grappling with this dialectic can produce a variety of forms of uh, hope or optimism that uh, can work. So I want to leave uh, some time uh, for questions. As, as Dr. Wurzel uh, mentioned, uh, the Climate Psychiatry Alliance is uh, an organization we can be contacted through at their website, and it's also an organization any psychiatrist can join. Within the APA, any psychiatrist can join the Climate Caucus. Um, again, we're late to this party, but thank goodness we're here. And uh, regardless of our, our interest within psychiatry, uh, we can think about uh, what can we do. Uh, so we have time now for uh, discussion. Thank you both for that presentation. I don't see any questions yet, but I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about how you incorporate this in the, the first encounter with patients or screening of how climate change is affecting the patient. Are there any screening forms or, or how do you go about that? There's interest in developing um, formal screening. Um, it, it doesn't, as far as I know, it doesn't yet exist. What, what I find is that this is like any topic that might be uncomfortable. This is like um, sex or spirituality, anything like that, where it's the therapist's ability to be with it that determines the likelihood of it coming up. You know, it's the therapist's ability to be with it that allows for the therapist to hear things that they might not otherwise hear. So for instance, a patient comes in, you ask them how they're doing, and they say, well, there's the state of the world, but I'm okay. You know, and it may be tempting to just go ahead and ask them about their mood and sleep or whatever, but they just said something very important um, that, that you can, can explore. Oh, many people are worried about the state of the world. What most concerns you? Um, so, uh, the, the sensitization to the fact that it, it often will come up is important. I'm not aware of, of formal screening tools at this point.
Let's see a question. What are best practices in group work to help individuals and communities learn to support each other around climate change and eco-anxiety? Also, what can faith communities do to facilitate, facilitate the spiritual? Um, with regards to best practices, one, one a consequence of us all being late to this party is that there isn't the research base we would want uh, for the kinds of interventions that we need. Um, there are many things being done. There are so-called climate cafes where um, there's a facilitator that helps a group um, process something. Um, there are uh, less formal process groups that are springing up all over the place. And you ask about faith communities, almost every religious denomination um, has some kind of uh, climate advocacy uh, work going on. Um, so organically, uh, groups have sprung up all over the place. And that model I mentioned, um, transformational resilience, um, anecdotally, um, is being found by many people to be very popular, but it's not yet researched. It, it has so much uh, enthusiasm that it's actually being proposed to Congress as, as a means of, um, of thinking about public health measures. Um, but in terms of best practices, I, we do not yet have the evidence base to be able to say. And I'll just add that, um, you know, so much of this stage is psychoeducation, um, providing patients the recognition that what they are experiencing is eco-anxiety, and then giving parents uh, tools to try to help guide their children about how to have agency and um, feel like, uh, you know, they don't have to just sit with existential dread without meeting, without the ability to do anything about it. Um, it's interesting, uh, Janet and I were just involved with um, producing a children's book on um, addressing climate change and mental health for um, parents to have a sense of the kinds of conversations and the kinds of activities they can have with their children to address it. Um, I'm happy to drop it in the chat if you'd like, um, but basically it's a uh, it's a fun little reference that you can, um, you know, consider using with your patients if you're in the child world or certainly with your own families. Um, I was thinking that there's probably a, a, in the child psychiatry world, there's probably the issue of the, the generational differences and how maybe the, the younger, the kids and younger adults have more of this, this worry and this anxiety and how to help families and, and others um, navigate this conversation. So that's great. Um, there is specific advice in, in that little children's book. So can you put that in the chat, uh, Josh, the, the name of it? I just dropped yes, in it. Here's exactly. the link to, uh, to the book where you can get it. It's called Coco's Fire, uh, something about addressing climate anxiety or changing climate anxiety into climate inspiration. I should know this. We've been spending the past <laughs> year on it, but I don't know. If I... Thank you for sharing that. It's about a cute little squirrel. It's a, it's a lovely little book, but it also includes direct advice for parents about having these conversations. Uh, any other last minute questions? I know we have about one more minute. Well, thank you both again for your time and for sharing this wonderful information. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. It's been delightful. Likewise. No, it's an honor to be here.